Hey there, how's it going? Good, thanks Luke for, uh, for answering that. Um, wow, there's, like, there's a, literally more people than I expected to be here uh, this side of lunch for a talk about data and privacy. Um, but if you're bored, it's mostly your fault because the, the title's right there, right? So we'll, uh, we'll do what we can. Actually, there's all people walking in. Don't, just stay out. There's a more interesting one in the other room, surely. <laughs> okay. Um, this, uh, this talk is more or less an overview. Some of you might find it, uh, like, some of you will find it too basic if you have any familiarity with GDPR and data law. Uh, others of you might find it just insightful and give you just enough to understand kind of the basics. It's a few hundred pages of legislation, and there's a, there's a you know, a many, many billion dollar industry being generated because of this. So um, the chances that we're going to get to the depths of that are, are minimal. I'm curious to know who has heard of GDPR in the last few months? Um, Who's, who, um, just, does anyone here like have a, a site or a service targeted at Europe or uh, have anything to do with Europe? Oh wow, cool, great. Um, and then um, who, are, who are here's major, major interaction with GDPR has just been the annoying emails and the chance to unsubscribe to everything that you didn't know you were, yeah. Yeah, that's fair, it was, a good, it was good for that. Um, well, I, um, I work with, uh, with XWP, we're a WordPress agency, we deliver uh, enterprise solutions uh, with, with WordPress, and I'm a team lead. Uh, the important red text there is that I'm not a lawyer, so please, I hope you don't misconstrue anything I say as legal advice today, of course. Um, and I, I, you know, this is an overview I encourage. What I would hope is that I would point out things maybe that you might think, you know what, I should, I should have a look into this, I should engage a legal expert uh, if you find there's a need there. Um, chances are someone in this room, you may, you, you have, if you are a legal expert and you've come to this because you think of something during the Q&A, please pipe up and answer the questions instead of me. I will not be upset if you do that. Um, these, are, uh, these are my rugrats that are, are at home right now and this is my family. I work remotely so often I'm working at home with them screaming in the background. I don't know any of you, does anyone else here work remotely or work from home? Uh, and how many of you had the experience of the guy on the BBC talking with the Korean man, you know, where your kids have been in the background? Yeah, we've, we've, we've all had that one and had to yell at our kids at some point um, from a call. But yeah, that's, uh, that's my family. Uh, aside from, um, you know, being famous for internet quotes, Napoleon, you know, several hundred years ago, you know, well, 150 years ago, had this... Um, this quote that helps us to understand, you know, kind of the depth behind when we talk about data, when we talk about information, how valuable this really is, and the extent to which um, this has, has power. I mean, data has the power to bring, to hold entire countries at ransom, uh, you know, or, or a lack of data, a lack of information has enough to leave you completely blind and, and useless. Uh, so it's no small thing that we, we bring this up. Uh, but it's worth asking why, though, at a, at a word, word camp, are we, are we talking about data? And what I want to do is I want to, uh, I'm going to talk about GDPR, but I, I, there are sort of two other areas that I want to uh, brush on as well. Um, so these are the three areas that I really want to, uh, to approach data privacy from an ethical standpoint, a commercial standpoint, and a, a legal standpoint. And I'm going to do it in that order. Um, you might think, I would tend to think that um, a lot of my talk, like the majority of it, will probably be around the legal side, but I would argue that the, the top one could be uh, even probably more important if we were to really to think about, about all of this now. So uh, let's go there, the ethical case. Um, whoa. All right, just, do we need to even go through that now? <laughs> I think this um, thing's stuck. It just keeps like... No, it's literally stuck. Like, I think I need to pull it out. Uh, all right, I'll give it one more shot. If we get that going on again, though, uh, I'm going to ditch this thing and stand beside the... Oh, no, we're going to use a different one. Seamless. Continue. Oh, no, what is going on here? All right, and I press, the, oh, look at this. This one works, perfect. Uh, data itself really, um, when you think about it, data equals power. 
having someone's information. And we could go to, and I would love to, actually it's probably not the time to talk about the dystopian future, the 1984 Orwellian idea of a surveillance state. I mean, arguably you can see that in the present, you know, places in the Middle East and China and what's happening in these countries. It's frightening, to me it's frightening. It's frightening when I think about my kids and their future and what could go on. I mean, that, that is one zone we could go to this to, when we talk about the ethics of, of data privacy and protection. Um, but I, we'll wind it back to, to the present and some more like, uh, you know, <laughs> less intense issues. But still, they are still serious. For instance, um, you know, data is used really to, you know, in many ways to manipulate people into buying or believing or something. Um, you know, for instance, you know, finding data about someone like finding out this, here's an interesting thing I learned the other day. We're obviously, I think we're all aware that we're more likely to buy something if we know that our friends like it. But research has, sh has shown that if, if I was to gather your two closest friends on, say, Facebook, take their faces, create a composite, which you would never recognize as your two friends, because we're actually really, uh, we're, we're very poor at recognizing composite faces, uh, even our own. And, and I was to advertise to you a product with a composite of your two closest friends, you would be far more likely to buy that product. Now that's actually, not, that's simple, that's, there is like, there's software that could do that easily right now. But, but quite quickly, you can be manipulated without your knowing, just by knowing a few things about you. You can be manipulated to believe something, uh, algorithms that profile you to understand you. Um, not only that, you know, the data around you, especially your search history, can begin to, I think if you're, you're familiar with the, the philosophy of, say, DuckDuckGo and other search engines, begin to actually encapsulate you in this silo of information where when a search engine understands what they think you're looking for, they begin to show you more of what you've been looking for. So you no longer receive an objective understanding of the world or a news story, an ethical issue or so on. You can actually start to be trapped in a world of your own philosophies. Um, beyond that, um, you know, as well as that, I mean, obviously, selling your information, selling it you know, um, to other people without your consent, I mean, as if that's not already happening and happened. Um, and, and last of all, you know, the, uh, the issue of, of, you of a company being hacked and your data, your precious data being uh, stolen uh, and used against you. Uh, there is a lot of power that comes with data to manipulate, to silo, to control. Uh, and so we need to take it very, very seriously. Um, Oh, here we go. Sorry, I, I'm getting confused between here and here. So, I mean, when, I th when we think about WordPress, why does this have to do anything to do with WordPress? You know, my philosophy, my belief about WordPress is WordPress is a bastion of the free internet, of open source, of this idea that um, if you have a good enough idea, it shouldn't matter where you are and who you are, you know, that you have an opportunity to bring a great idea to life. There is great software that can empower you to build something uh, for yourself. Often, tyrannical data practices stand for the opposite to actually box people in, to take advantage of vulnerable people who either don't know or don't understand uh, what's going on when they're engaging with online services. Um, and uh, not only that, I mean, I, I really think that to be in WordPress is to stand for ethical, uh, ethical practice online and ethical use of the internet. Anyway, that, there's an ethical case for, uh, for, for data and for data privacy. Now let's, let's move on to commercial. I want to ask a question here. Could you everyone put your hand up, please? Go on, everyone, put your hand up. Let's do it. Uh, keep your hand raised if you trust big companies, let's say Facebook or Google, if you trust them with your data. Okay. No, you can keep your hand raised if you actually trust them and you want to own up to that. I mean, we, we may be a slightly biased, or biased audience, to, you know, because we have a technical background, maybe most of us here. Um, all right, let's do it again. Everyone, hands up again. Let me ask an even deeper question. Keep your hand up if you think that big companies are actually being honest about the way that they use your data. <laughs> you know? Let me show you um, something. This, uh, this graph on the right here, this, was, um, this is two years old. Okay, this, this servo is two years old now, so it's, v it's actually very old when you think about it. Um, this is the percent of consumers in these countries who think that big companies are not being honest about their data. Like in France, 62%. I mean, Australia is probably going to be comparable, I would think. And I actually think that two years on, with Equifax, with Cambridge Analytica, with everything that has happened in the last year or even six months, I can't imagine these numbers are any lower. In fact, I think they're much higher. And then over here, this is a percent of consumers who trust companies to do the right thing with their personal data. Here in France, like almost one in 10 can you imagine as you as a, as a service offering something, if only one in 10 people came through your door trusted you? 
that's, that's actually, this not far out. This is actually probably accurate. And now, we are talking probably about bigger companies. Probably, this is probably people are thinking about that and maybe you don't fall within that category. But when you think about it, what they are doing is creating a reputation and a mistrust amongst consumers for the way that we, you know, we are handling and using their, their data. Here as well, this is the percent of consumers who would, this is even more important, who would not allow a company they do not trust to use data about them. Around 75% across the board who, would, who wouldn't give their data to a company they wouldn't trust. Now, why is that important? Because data is essential, right? It's powerful and the, the downside to data, the tyranny that can follow if we don't do it well uh, is, is there. But from a commercial standpoint as well, like, you know, data is highly effective for the way we run our business to understand your market. I mean, it's a huge cost saving if you can get good intelligence from the people that you're working with or offering a service to. Uh, time reduction and building the right product, product development, um, enhancing your service. Having good data is, is, is brilliant for business. But like I just said, three out of four people are not going to give their data to someone they don't trust actually creates quite a compelling opportunity for us to actually become good data stewards. I actually think would put this case forward that right now the market is ripe with a, an opportunity for people to say, I am a good data steward who cares about your personal data and your privacy. Uh, and you could make a case. Now, I th we've, you're working backwards now. I think, you know, probably 10 years ago, you might have worked from a place where people automatically trusted people with their data. And so, you know, you would have had to lose that trust. I actually think the reverse is true now. For most of us in this room, I mean, you all put your hands down. Your default mode is probably not to trust the company with your data right now until they earn your trust. So how, you know, how do we do that? Um, you know, data awareness is growing, and this is, this is an opportunity. I, uh, I'm going to change tax again. Like, I know I'm kind of bouncing around these three. And don't worry, I'll draw it all together towards the end of this, this presentation. Um, but we've considered the ethical ramifications for where bad data practice could go. Um, we've considered that there is a commercial case for being good data stewards. And I want to talk about just some aspects of the general data protection regulation, the GDPR. And, and what I would like you to think about is this. Only maybe a, a, a fifth or a sixth of the people in this room put your hand up when you said you were targeting someone in Europe or you had a European case of why you should care about GDPR. It probably is more than that. You may not even realize. Um, but I think considering the first two, what I'm about to present should be relevant for all of us. Because I'm going to put forward some things that are in GDPR that I actually think we should all care about, and my personal opinion, and we can debate and disagree about this, but my personal opinion is that GDPR itself is a great thing. It's a good thing for the world. It's probably a bad thing for a lot of people. I mean, I don't, I don't own a big business in Europe and have to foot a billion dollar legal bill for anything, so I've got a pretty um, a sheltered opinion about this. But what I do think, when we consider the, the landscape of data use and data privacy, that it is instilling and starting a conversation around the world around what healthy and good principles are for protecting the data of consumers. So let's consider a few things. The data, uh, this, this regulation, for those who don't understand, this uh, replaced a 20-year-old, uh, it was a data protection directive. That was what existed in Europe before this. That wasn't a, a legislation. It was just, it was interpreted into local laws within Europe. Um, it was very outdated. It was kind of from almost pre-internet and it had to try and cover the, 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 the internet um, of, of today. Um, but it was quite limited. GDPR is kind of solving a problem to bring together European uh, data laws and also in, you know, getting authorities that could enforce this. Does GDPR apply to me? Well, actually, um, GDPR is actually any company processing the personal data of subjects who are in the union. It doesn't actually target the companies in Europe. It actually targets companies who target people to target citizens within the European Union. So if you're an Australian company and you're shipping to, um, to somewhere in Europe, you actually are within the remit of the GDPR. Now, ways that you might be in, in, uh, accountable to this is if, say, you provide uh, the ability to order goods or services in a European language, um, perhaps providing payment options in EU currencies or the, or the euro, let's say, um, providing local content, um, offering potential EU customers um, you know, international-friendly services. So, 
you know, if, you know, people might ask and say, well, look, what if someone from Europe visits my, my site? Like, now, I'm not, let me not give legal advice here, but I personally, in my understanding of people I've listened to, do not think that you will be targeted by data protection authorities in Europe if someone from Europe visits your site and you have their data and do something with it that is not within the, you know, these, these laws. Um, but if you're actively targeting people, yes, you could be accountable. Um, and it's worth considering um, that this will, will likely be enforced in, you know, internationally um, as, as well. Let me just um, give a couple of reasons. I mean, in Australia, under the Data Protection Act, um, the um, fines kind of max out at two and a half million dollars. I mean, only companies with an re annual revenue over three million are accountable in the first place. Um, but fines max out at that point. In Europe, in the UK recently, up until now, fines max out at half a million pounds, so even, even probably less than that. But under GDPR, failure to comply can be, mean a fine of up to 20 million euros f per issue, like per non-compliance, and beyond that, up to 4% of global revenue. When you think about a big tech company, this is billions, billions of dollars that you're, you're accountable for. Um, as well as this idea, um, probably it's yet to be fleshed out how international enforcement will go about, but it's not like international law isn't enforced already in other cases, so I don't think it's a hurdle that they won't jump over or at least shut off your service to Europe if you're not in compliance. Um, but there is a case for many people in this room to follow because you could be accountable to these laws. Now, beyond that, the even scarier point are probably these guys. Uh, the day after GDPR went, uh, was enforced, May 25th of this year, uh, Facebook and Google were leveled with $8.8 .8 billion worth of suits in one day, right? So we kind of sit at, like, you know, GDPR actually enables, like, class action lawsuits and suits to be, to be filed underneath this legislation. So we're probably watching the dawn of a new legal industry. Um, this is going to be a big deal. If you're, if you're a legal expert, I would suggest flying to Europe, you, branding yourself as some kind of data or digital law expert, and then throwing another zero um, to your paycheck, because chances are that that's, you know, you could, you could get a piece of the pie. Um, but yeah, civil action is going to be going to be a, a big deal uh, under GDPR. Um, what I want to do is I just want to go over four major changes. Now, there's probably 10 things we could talk about, but just to, for the sake of time and um, you know, the, probably the more interesting ones, these are four that I think are really uh, worth talking about. Are you bored yet? Good. Uh, data types. Um, there are a, a set of data types that were not previously classified under you know, many laws as ones that would be accountable or considered even personal data. For, interest, uh, for, for example, an IP address or a unique ID on a, a mobile phone or a device ID uh, were not really considered, I think in the United States, even in Europe, considered personal identifiers, but now are. Which would mean that the rest of it all, uh, so if you were to harvest someone's IP address, you would need proper consent under GDPR as well. I mean, that's a, that's a big deal even right there. Uh, beyond that as well, geolocation data as well. No longer is that just considered data that you can just grab. It actually is, a, you're accountable under GDPR for how you handle, how you harvest, and how you take that, that data. GDPR also introduced this concept of sensible Pers uh, sensitive personal data, and it has an extra set of um, ramifications for how you deal with that, but health, sexual orientation, race, religion, political opinion, uh, even biometric data as well, like you know, genetic data and, and fingerprints. Um, these are actually sensitive personal data under GDPR, and this actually requires an even great, I mean, you, you've got to have a good reason, you know, more or less you've got to have a good reason to hold uh, this data. Um, and you, you know, there's some added layers to how you need to pr protect that data. But it's just worth knowing that there is a separate category of data. You might know someone's like name or their email address or someone, but that's not in the same category as like their fingerprints or you know their genetic material. Um, yeah, let me um, let me move on to to consent. I'm kind of skimming through this because there's, there's a lot to get through. Uh, consent in, uh, you know, in times gone by was kind of considered that we could just allow someone like a pre-ticked box or, you know, by being in this room, you consent to me recording you and, um, under, you know, knowing everything about you, right? Um, no longer under GDPR. Consent is, um, is, needs to be explicit. Uh, and like, say, in Australian data law, there is kind of an allowance for this, um, you know, consent by... Uh, by simply being there, um, you know, this is kind of what, what, what can fly under Australian data law, but it won't fly uh, under GDPR. Consent uh, needs to be, let me say this, I'm going to read it straight off. The consent needs to be freely given, specific, informed, 
an unambiguous indication of their wishes, either by a statement or clear affirmative action. So, under GDPR, not only does consent need to be clear, and do you need to be telling people why you're collecting their data and what you're going to do with it, they literally need to, to tick something or agree to something or make an affirmative action to do that. It presents a pretty decent UX challenge. I mean, every point of friction in a UX pathway, so to buy a product or to access a service, um, you know, we understand affects conversion. So there's a pretty big UX, uh, big UX challenge here for people, especially in Europe, if you're in e-commerce, um, to, to help people to move through that pathway uh, you know, e efficiently without as much hindrance. But I do think for, for many people, this will have the effect of either causing their pathways to become more cluttered or probably cause people to rethink what they're collecting in the first place. If I'm asking for someone's biometric data and I don't really need it, maybe I should stop asking for it, maybe I should stop collecting it. I think that itself might actually be like a, a for, as far as the consumer is concerned, a, a good piece. Um, revoking consent must be just as easy. Um, no longer hidden in behind, you know, 400 layers of settings, menus and options where you can go finally figure out how to tell Facebook you don't want them to know something about you. Um, and it also applies to some of, you know, data already collected. So if you have a big you know, database of people's personal information, if you can't show that you collected that information with proper consent, uh, I, you know, my understanding is under GDPR would actually have to delete that data and, and get rid of it, probably start again. So I think a lot of people, um, when you got all those annoying emails, you were actually getting a lot of people who were just re-establishing consent to either keep the data they already had about you or to continue the, the process they were on uh, with you. Um, and, and, and lastly, it must be used only for the purpose it was col collected. Uh, these kind of vague statements like, um, you know, we use your data for marketing purposes or product development or uh, research or at a later date, these won't fly anymore. These vague terms, you know, co you know consent now needs to be clear and unambiguous. Um, you know, this is, I mean, I, th I think as a consumer, I think this is a great thing. But once again, it, it does present a challenge if you're using data for a, a lot of different reasons. Let's talk about breaches. Um, companies now, I mean, I in Australia, I think, you know, you don't have an, an obligation to necessarily notify your, your users of a, of a breach unless there is specific harm that could be, or a specific risk to them because of the breach, uh, or even to notify an authority. But under GDPR, um, you have a 72-hour deadline. This is a pretty big deal. 72 hours is not very long, especially because most companies don't actually know the nature of what was taken, let's say, until weeks or months after the event. So it's probably yet to see how this works out and how many companies can really comply with this. But also, it's a PR nightmare. Imagine telling your PR department, guys, wake up, we've had a breach. In three days' time, we're going to be on the front cover of Wired uh, or something, and, and everyone's going to know that we had a... You know, how are we going to spin this so it doesn't sound... So, I mean, the P PR departments are going, to, are going to hate this one. Um, and obviously, um, if there was a significant risk, you know, if you held the data of someone's home address or something, and it was... I, I don't know, I'm trying to think of the, the kind of areas that, that could be actually risky. Um, you, you need to contact the, your users, your consumers with, with undue delay. Um, this, um, this would mean, I think, for many companies, they'll need reporting policies and procedures, breach templates, all these kind of things um, to help deal with the instance in which they, they have a data breach. Um, my new rights, the rights that you have under GDPR. Uh, there are a few ones that are, are really important for, for a start. I, I'd imagine most of us have heard about this one, the right to be forgotten. This is an extension of a previous landmark case in, in Europe, in Spain, I believe, um, over the right to be forgotten or to be deleted from Google search history. I mean, oh, Google search request was, I think, the specific case. But now it's enshrined in, in law, um, in, in Europe at least, that if, you're a, if a company has your data, you should be able to contact them. There should be no, I think, uh, undue undue penalty um, for doing that. There's no like 40 euro fee for you to uh, have your data deleted. I, I understand that that's kind of covered in there. Um, and it, I think there's even a 30 day, I think you've got 30 days actually to, to comply with this, but for you to delete all the data you have on someone, this is a tremendous technological challenge, especially for systems that have been built up until this point with no uh, element of design put into this that we would have to go back and delete all the records for a, a specific individual, um, especially when you think about backups 
as well. I mean, backups hold, hold to there. We could, we could talk about that in the, the Q&A about how people are going to handle that. Someone in this room actually may have been thinking about this. I would be curious to know how other people have started to, to think about this. But, but data subjects do have this right to say, all the stuff you know about me, I want you to delete it. The exception would be a legal case like you know, you know, tax information or um, criminal uh, these kind of these kind of bits of information that there is a legal reason you might need to hold something for say seven years or whatever um, that would obviously override um, the data subject's rights in this case. The right to restrict processing you could also this is kind of a a, a, a lesser right but you could, a company could have your information but you could tell them I don't want you to use my information anymore. It's one step less than deleting it but it's also saying I don't I don't want you to to process my data anymore. Uh, data portability. Users now have the right to request all the data that a company has on them uh, in like a machine readable format, whatever that means. I mean, it's kind of, it's a little bit uh, hazy in the legislation. But the idea would be, let's say you, you know, you have a health insurance provider and you, um, they have all this information about you. You can request that they give you a printout version of CSV or something that has every bit of information about you. And you could take that straight to a competitor and say, hey, here's, here's my background and here's all the information that this, this company has about me. But this is a, a right that people have to be portable, to move their data sets around. I think it kind of gives some power back to the individual instead of to, the, to, to a, a corporation. Uh, as well as knowledge of profiling, if you are being profiled, which you are, which I am, which we all are, right? I mean, it's, go, it's going on, but we, you know, the idea that you should have knowledge that someone is building a profile of you and about you and trying to, to understand more about you. I mean, if that profile began to imply, let's say, for instance, someone has a profile about you, what you're clicking and what you're doing, they go, well, Cambridge Analytica on you, and they start to say, well, this person's probably conservative or they're probably this and probably that. They might start to think your sexual orientation, your political persuasion, your religious beliefs, and all these kind of things. Once they generate that data about you by profiling, they now have sensitive personal data on you as well, right? So if you think about it, if you, if you deduce, if such and such says, I eat kosher, oh, they're probably Jewish, right? So now you have a piece of, um, and actually this is funny, it's quickly, it's very quick how fast you could have someone's sensitive personal data. Someone ticks kosher, you basically have a sensitive piece of information about them. Some people might even argue that if, some, if you take shirt sizes, that you know someone's biometric data because you know their body shape or their body type or something like that. I don't know how that will fly, but some people suggest that even that could be considered, um, you know, personal data. Now let's um, let's change. So those are some of the high-level pieces of GDPR. Um, we could talk about some more in the Q and A if you want to, but I, I want to wrap this up talking about WordPress, the way WordPress is addressing this, and then even just some thoughts for us to take away about how we each can. Can approach this. So I've given a, a, a legal, an ethical, and a, and a commercial reason to care about data privacy and some of the ways the law is addressing it, which I do think address the ways that we could address it commercially with transparency, with proper consent, with proper care, um, as, you know, as well as, as good ethical reasons. This, uh, this guy up here is Leo. He works at XWP as well. Uh, he's on the core team uh, for WordPress and data privacy. Um, and he was a big piece of the 4.9.6 release um, where they implemented a set of changes to help site owners with compliance to GDPR. So some of the major changes were comment consent. Uh, having said that, um, the wording needs to be altered a little bit. You should be able to find some information about that. If you are in Europe and you need to get proper consent to have someone's comment on your site, which is their personal information, um, they, um, you, you may need to alter the wording around that uh, a little bit more. There's also, for those of you who haven't seen, I hope you've had a look at this, uh, a data export and erasure feature. If you haven't had a look through it, um, it might be a bit confusing just trying to work it out in the, the admin. Uh, find it, there's some really good YouTube tutorials. If you just type in, uh, you know, GDPR and WordPress, there's some people who've walked through the process um, of how to export someone's data should you get that request um, or to, um, or to uh, erase someone's data if you get that request as well. But it's worth knowing that it's built into WordPress, it's baked into Core now, so that within your data tables you can comply with this. That's a really, really big deal that they got that out quickly so that businesses, people in WordPress could comply with that. Um, I think hats off to WordPress and the core team for getting that through so quickly. It's really empowering. Um, as well as a privacy policy uh, generator. It kind of gives the bare bones. Um, privacy policies are one of those things, it's just, you must have it. Like we all, you, you really, really need to have them. Um, 
and generating them now is easier than ever. Literally, I was, there's, a, there's a New Zealand-based one that I came across even just by Googling around that you could just answer a set of questions and it like spat out a privacy policy. May not cover everything and a, and a lawyer might shoot me for suggesting something like that, but, I, but the, the bare bones and getting started in generating a privacy policy, even I'm guessing a terrible one's better than none at all, um, it's, it's there. And there are a lot of tools to, to help you to generate those things, including in WordPress core uh, now as well. Um, the only thing Leo told me to say was there's still some gaps in localization. So the way in which um, WordPress core handles um, this uh, may, you know, will differ um, for, for compliance. It's kind of they're trying to get compliance with the EU data laws, which is a good idea, but getting compliance with other countries, um, you know, there are gaps in how it's localized. So you'll need to understand that um, for, for yourself. So what should I be doing about this? Um, for a start, checking your plugins. Um, most of the major ones you will have seen have updated with compliance to GDPR. It's really good. If you rely heavily on a plugin that um, is not in compliance, I suggest, I mean, I don't know, you know, do, do, do what you want to do, but finding one that um, is analogous, that is in compliance, um, is, a, is a great idea. That's a good practice in general because the GDPR compliance will basically ensure compliance with, say, Australian data law. Australian data law is not as severe, although amendments could come to, to bring it up on par at any time. Um, uh, think about you know your other ones, email opt-in, cookie consent, Google Analytics. I think one thing you would want to do is turn off IP uh, collection in Google Analytics. I think that's one thing you need to turn off in order to be fully compliant, but Google Analytics has come a long way as well. Uh, create a po privacy policy, and then your general, I'm not going to go there, but it, you know, development requirements for having a secure website protecting people's data um, are really, really, really important. Uh, and the most important questions really Sit down and do this. I really think you should sit down one day if this is an issue you need to think about and ask these four questions and write honest answers to them. What data am I collecting? Am I, co am I collecting names, collecting emails, collecting shirt size, collecting religious this, I'm collecting that, collecting this, comments. I mean, just you, you really have to sit and think about every possible little edge case that you could be collecting. And then, and then ask yourself, where am I storing it? There are ramifications for where you store data. If you're storing it offshore, at least understand where, where you're storing it. Because if you are storing it somewhere, um, there are kind of zones that GDPR seems to de define as not uh, acceptable places to store information if you're doing offshore, off your um, cloud storage or something like that. But w have a look into that, I, I suggest. Then ask this question, why am I collecting it in the first place? Do I need it? Do I, I mean, I'm collecting this stuff. Do I need it for anything? And then ask, did I get proper permission to have it? And go and have a look through that. The, excuse me, the previous philosophy around data collection was always collect everything and work out what to do with it later. We really need to, as a, as a community, you know, as, a, as, a, as citizens of the US start to reverse and think, let's collect just what we need. Right? That's, that's really, let's collect what we need for now. If I need more, da more data, more data, I'll, I'll go and collect that later um, and start to get away from this idea of just bulk collecting information just because we should, just because we could um, as an idea. Let me finish on this. The re this is my boys again. Sorry, it's Jude and that's Leo. Because when we think about the future, I mean, what future are we heading towards? This is really where I want to close this up. Are we heading towards like, a, a, like that dystopian future that we all think of where, it, where my kids will grow up with intricate profiles about them, about their race, about their persuasions, about everything about them, the fact that they've got middle class white parents and they're probably going to, they're watching Peppa Pig and they're going to want to buy this and buy that and buy this and that they are profiled to the extent at which companies can access and know everything about them, manipulate them, use them. Or are they going to grow up in a world where they have control of their data, where they have freedom, where they're not vulnerable to the attacks of, of, uh, and, and the, you know, the uh, manipulation and tyranny of large corporations? I mean, I think that's what's at stake here, is our future, uh, where we're headed. I think WordPress has you know, 30% of the internet. I think we have some power in, in shaping the future uh, of the internet and how we, how we go about data. Uh, that's, yeah, that's it. We can uh, have some questions now, I suppose. Remember the red thing that said, not a lawyer? I'll do, I'll do my best, but yeah. If anyone actually is a lawyer here and they do know about this, please ch chime in. Um, while you were talking about uh, the ram uh, I was just thinking about the ramifications of uh, data. Um, so if you've got a, a site, a uh, WordPress site, and a user comes along and says, I want my personal data removed, you've 
theoretically got to go through all the backups that you've made of that site as mm. well and remove that data, don't you? The theoretically, yes. I think there is a, um, a piece in there that is like, a, it's, it's kind of around, um, what's the, I, I need to get the wording right, but it's kind of like there's some kind of fairness element to that. Like within reason, you have to do that. Um, so there are a couple of things to think about. There's number one, what are all the backups that you have? And within reason, if something's backed up to tape, then yeah, I, I don't know, you're probably not going to have to. And people are probably aren't going to chase you down if it was like, look, it would have cost me like 50 hours to get one person's data out. And I have to pr repeat the process. Um, you, you, you know, you would probably get away with that if you could honestly stand up in, you know, think, always think of this. If I had to stand up in front of a court and tell them, and they said to me, why didn't you delete this person's data? Like, so seriously, man, it was going to take me 100 hours to delete this one person's data. They might say, well, okay, at least you tried. And you can say, but I did delete this, this, and this, and I removed records from here. Um, I think the, the two things we're thinking are, number one, where have you on-shared that data? Has your content been syndicated elsewhere? And are, are there other data controllers that have data that you collected? Because you would have a responsibility to contact them and ask them to delete it as well. So that's one piece. And you would have to, you, can, you can't really get them to do that, but you would have to show that you asked them to to delete that. Um, and secondly, if you had built your data backup system post May 25th, 2018, when the data was enforced, or even two years ago when we knew about GDPR, and you showed that you built and designed a system where you could not simply and more readily uh, erase individual data records, you may not have such a good case then. Big part of GDPR is, that, well, now you know, design with privacy in mind. Design with these things in mind. So if you're using an old retro system, you may have a case for why it was too hard, but if you use something new or you build something new and you still didn't do it with compliance and with the knowledge in mind, I think that's when you wouldn't have a case. I think it's a, it's a gray area though, because but there is some wording in the law about the, the reasonable amount of effort you need to go into to do that. Yeah, you could, you could say that, ease of access um, or the reasonable amount of effort you need to go to to, to do that. It's technically feasible is, to use the specific language. Yeah. But if you can possibly do it, then you should. But if it would cost you a massive amount of money or something, then you don't have to. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that's more or less the, I think that's the sentiment behind it, yeah. It's, you, you pointed on one of the grey areas, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. There were definitely people closer to you, but if you want to go for a run, yeah. Um, I've got two quick questions, if that's okay. Oh, yeah, please. Um, if the data that you have, I, like, I know you're not a lawyer, so I won't be offended Thank if you. you don't know the answer. Um, <laughs> if the data that you have, like, does not reveal that they're Europe, like European based, does the GDPR still apply? <laughs> yes, I would say so. If they are okay. from Europe, it wouldn't matter what you had about them. It would be more the fact that they are European, whether you could plead ignorance if that's what you're suggesting. But yeah, yeah, I wouldn't think so. Okay. And like one project I'm working on at the moment, I know like if someone says delete my account, I know that will break everything. Like uh -huh. in, in that instance, like for example, would anonymizing all their data be an adequate substitute? There are provisions for anonymization and pseudonymization within GDPR, and they're, they're there in recommended processes. That's, I don't know, but anonymizing a set of data that instead of deleting it, actually, I haven't, I haven't heard of someone suggesting that path, a pathway to deletion. I suppose it's a similar kind of concept. But I know anonymization, the, the tricky thing with anonymization and pseudonymization is actually really hard. There's generally going to be a Rosetta Stone somewhere that allows people to match tables and find out that person's record. So they are considered preferable and pri designed by privacy practices that you should do whenever you can and make pseudonymization and anonymization available to users. But, oh, that's, yeah, that's good. Find out, you know, I don't know, instead of deleting, can I anonymize? I don't know. I hadn't even thought of that. Anyone That's else? Good. There's a guy waving over there. I thought he's the guy that we should really. <laughs> well, you've, yeah, obviously, I have a question you really want to ask. So. It's not really more of a question, more of a statement. You said about data breaches. Um, there, is, there is an important legislation in Australia about notifal, uh, notifiable data breaches, which came out in February, which, if yeah. anybody's host in Australia, should be aware of. So. Yeah. sort of flagging that if you weren't aware of that. Uh, the other thing too is that um, it's a big rule to put out globally saying 
we're going to go after people do this, but you think if we've got a third of the internet running WordPress, and how many people does it take to try and keep that compliance in place, it's, um, it's a bit of a uh, hard ask to try and do it. That's not to say that we should be doing the right thing because we, we need to be doing the right thing, mm. so to speak. So yeah. I think we don't want to put the fear into people about saying, oh, they're coming after you because there's that. And there's also that pendulum effect at the moment we're seeing Scanner all the way like back there and we'll go that way and somewhere in between Australia will line up in between. So it's going to be a moving space as it progresses yeah. forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Hi, what about the rest of the world? What about them? <laughs> uh, do you mean like uh, are data laws changing and other, or how does this apply? I mean, yeah, like it's pretty scattered. I mean, um, the US has a very, I mean, the, the legislative system in the US, from what I understand, is you know, you've got state, county, country, like, so there are different layers to this. Um, and by and large, the U.S. is considered one of the most relaxed when it comes to data privacy. So this is a big deal for companies who are in the United States, who are operating in the United States and Europe, who now have to bring like all, like, you know, basically have to bring all of their operations within compliance to, to GDPR. So it's a big deal for those countries who were a long way off. If you're in Canada um, or even Australia, with more, you know, a, a greater and higher level of um, of law around this, um, the change won't be quite as far. But yeah, I think companies will weigh up and some companies will stop providing services to, to Europe because it's more expensive to become GDPR compliant than the amount of revenue they generate from their European business. Okay, we'll do one last question and then we'll wrap up for lunch. Hi, Brendan, thanks for that. Um, so my question's about whose responsibility is it to, to know all of this and then know when they're supposed to be implementing it. So we as a, as a WordPress community, as a tech community, tend to have heard this word. A lot of people haven't. Mm -hmm. And our clients come to us with, you know, th they want some, they want us to be able to tell them what they should know. But yeah. at, at our level, we're developing or we might be building a site, but we actually don't know what their legal requirements are based on their businesses. Yeah. And a lot of people are DIYing, so they're, they're creating their own websites. They have no idea how to anonymise or to remove data from their, from their websites. They have no idea. You go into like a WooCommerce site, you configure it, you don't know what, how, to, how to look after the storage of the data there. What are your thoughts on kind of the education process yeah. um, from the DIYs up to the businesses who say, oh, we'll just make it G you know, GDPR compliant. It's like, no, actually, you need to sort your privacy policy out. You need to talk to your lawyers about your terms of use. And, you, you know, you need to have a bit of responsibility and ownership over this because it's your business that is going to be affected by it if someone comes knocking. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Okay. There's a lot. There's a lot to that. But the last sort of sentence or two you put there are probably where my opinion rests. I actually think there's an because uh, we we deal with this as well. Companies that come to us and they need something and they they talk about GDPR compliance. Um, I suppose there's two approaches you could go with there, which is like, hey, we don't we don't touch this. We do what we can, but we need you to make recommendations, and you're the one who's going to be accountable to this at the end. Um, or at the other end, you're like, okay, well, we're gonna, we are going to build in GDPR compliance for you. If you were going to take on that kind of risk, I think you'd be arming yourself with a digital law expert to be able to, to properly offer that service and guarantee some level of compliance. Whether someone wants to actually guarantee compliance is a big deal considering the level of fines that are involved with this. Um, but yeah, individuals themselves, the business owner themselves, they are the, they are the point of accountability, not an agency. But it, is an, it probably is an offering, a service offering that you can increase and say, hey, when we build for you, we include um, some level of GDPR compliance. A GDPR a privacy impact assessment might be an idea. We've done that for companies as well, where that we'll look at how they you know, do all their, their from, from the start to the end of how they process and collect data, and we'll do an assessment and make recommendations. We will still be careful to say this is not legal, but these are what we believe you need to do to comply. Do your final checks with a, with a lawyer at the other end. As far as education goes, I mean, I think WordPress is doing a pretty good job. I mean, most WordCamps seem to have a talk like this one right now. It's kind of like a mandatory talk for the last year and a half that someone took, someone gets up and talks about GDPR. Uh, and obviously, the WordPress core team, while they're fairly late to act, it kind of really kicked into the, to gear at the last minute, which is actually everyone with GDPR. Uh, they did a pretty good job of getting things in line uh, pretty quickly so that if you use WordPress out of the box and you're using plugins that are GDPR compliant, 
You've got a pretty good privacy policy. I think, you know, you, you know, it shouldn't be the craziest thing in the world to think you could offer something. Is that my time? No, you've still got one minute. Still okay. one minute. This is romantic. It's lovely. Uh, no, it's... Yep. Um, I, I, you know, I, I do think it's, appro it's approachable for someone who is not making data their core. Now, it's just worth mentioning, um, under GDPR, if you... One requirement for any company whose core activity is data collection uh, is to appoint a DPO, a data protection officer. This person is not an engineer, they're not necessarily a lawyer, you know, they don't have to be anything. What they have to do is represent the GDPR compliance to your organization at an exec level. They need to be appointed with you know, executive power to help make sure that everything you do is compliant. And at the end of the day, they would stand on behalf of your company in front of a data protection authority in Europe um, to defend or over, oversee what you're doing. So if, if you, like I said, that's not everyone, like our company didn't you know, need to do that, but if your core activity is data collection and around, so let's say you're a health provider, you're a bank, you know, you're a social network, you know, any of these kind of things, um, then yes, you would need to appoint a data protection officer. It's also worth remembering as well that there's not only, there's an introduced role of a data protection officer, there's an introduced concept of a, a data controller and a data processor. A data controller is the person who asks for the data and who wants the data and who desires it. A processor might be like you know, an, you know, an affiliate email marketing um, solution, or cloud hosting or something like this, who actually goes and processes your data, like an AdSense network or something like that, who holds data that was given to them by a controller. GDPR makes the distinction and makes both parties accountable. The controller is primarily accountable, but a processor, that might be you in this room, if you process personal data that you didn't collect, under GDPR, you're still, you're still accountable for how you treat that data and how you use it, how you store it, and, and so on. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Nice one. One super, super last question. Being keynote speaker, sometimes, Luke, uh, you can... Oh, yeah, one. yeah. Uh, look, I, I know you're not a lawyer, but <laughs> is it data or data? It's... <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it's thank either. you so much. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys.